A lot about uh, biodiversity in the next half hour. It's my perspective guest coming up. But uh, COP16 kicking off this morning in Colombia. The stakes are extremely high. And Antonia is going to tell us uh, about what the papers are saying. Absolutely. Uh, let's start with this front page of French newspaper L'Humanité. Biodiversity, action or extinction. Just to give you an idea, in the inside pages there, they're citing figures that say... Um, up to 50% of global GDP depends on biodiversity and up to 40% of global jobs. Now, it goes without saying that it's extremely significant that this summit is being hosted in Colombia. This Colombian paper, El Espectador, uh, says COP16 is at home and we must take advantage of it. Uh, now, Colombia is what's called a mega diverse country. It's home to nearly 10% of global biodiversity. Thanks, uh, in no small part, of course, to the Amazon rainforest and the Pacific Ocean. Uh, now, The Guardian has this quite interesting piece as we look ahead to the pressure that those countries are now under to save the rainforest. Lula and Petro have the chance of a lifetime to save the Amazon. Can they unite uh, idealism and real politic to pull it off. Now, in this article, they cite figures saying that South America has lost up to 95% of its wildlife since 1970. Gustavo Petro and Lula, the presidents of Colombia and Brazil, are, of course, key custodians of the Amazon. Both of them have been very serious about slowing deforestation, Petro of Colombia more so than Lula, but they have different approaches to climate policy. Uh, Petro is extremely ambitious. He's been very hard on fossil fuels. He's signed an agreement and says he's no longer signing off new licences for uh, oil and gas exploitation, whereas Lula comes from a different political uh, school of thought on that, and he believes fossil fuels will be key to his country's development. However, the two men have this shared commitment to the Amazon, um, and so it'll be interesting to see in during this summit uh, what common ground they find. One area where we expect there will be common ground is something they're talking about here in Courrier International, which is the need for financing. The fact that Conservation, protecting land, that has a cost, not just conservation projects, not just forest rangers, but also the fact that they have to choose to not develop land and say no to its possible economic benefits in the name of conservation. So this idea that Gustavo Petro's Colombian side is putting forward is fair distribution of the profits from genetic data. Agriculture, pharmaceuticals, research and development, etc., all huge, draw, draw huge profits from using genetic data from biodiverse land, uh, sorry, gold mines like the Amazon. And what they're arguing is that if a country is making sacrifices to protect one of these biodiverse gold mines, those who profit from it should pay something for that, and those conserving those gold mines should make something. Now let's uh, stay in the Americas. Countdown to the US presidentials continues, as we reported in the news. Uh, Antonio is going to bring us up to speed on some of the stories that caught the imagination of the press over the weekend. Of course. So we'll look at this piece from the LA Times. Uh, uh, during a rally in Swing State, Pennsylvania, in this town of Latrobe, um, Donald Trump was talking up the local hero, uh, Arnold Palmer, who is, of course, uh, a golfer, a very, very famous golfer, but he wasn't praising him for his sporting prowess or his integrity, but his manhood, and let's be very clear that his manhood is anatomical uh, in Donald Trump's view. And in a state where there is less than 1% between the two candidates in the polls, uh, the Harris campaign didn't adopt the same strategy. Uh, her campaign responded by jibing Donald Trump focused on the issue most important to voters in this election, a deceased golfer's anatomy. Now, this um, sort of what apparently very lengthy rambling section of this rally has ca caused further questions to do with Donald Trump's state of mind. Uh, this uh, Financial Times piece says the vulgar rally ramble fuels questions about his state of mind. During the same rally, he called Kamala Harris, uh, warning strong language, a shit vice president. This is the kind of um, crossing a few boundaries that maybe... Uh, haven't been crossed quite so much up until now. And, of course, it's raising questions about Donald Trump's fitness for this job. Antonia. And uh, finally, from Antonia, a New Zealand airport wants to rein in those overly indulgent goodbyes, apparently. Yes, so The Guardian's telling us about this story. Uh, we're talking about Dunedin Airport in New Zealand, where they've put up this sign. It's got a mixed response. Maximum <laughs> hugging time, three minutes. For fonder farewells, please use the car park. Uh, they say that it is in the name of keeping the traffic moving and also in the name of allowing others to have hugs. They say too many people have been taking too long in the drop-off zone. 
Uh, on social media, some have commented that the policy or the sign is inhumane and the word tyranny was even thrown around, while others are pointing out that it's a much friendlier than uh, threatening fines, clamping wheels or even making the drop-off area expensive to park in. I love the idea they're going to have people with stopwatches there, timing people. Ellie, you're out of time. Out you go. Out to the car park. <laughs> Antonio, thanks a lot, Antonio, with the press review here on France 24. All the news uh, coming up for you after the break, including, uh, as I said, a lot more coverage as well at that COP16 conference. Do stay with us.